Hello, and welcome to our Revelation Bible study. My name is Pastor Mike Cherney from Trinity Lutheran Church here in the northeast of El Paso, Texas. You can find out more information about our church at trinityelpaso.org and find out when service times is and everything. We would love to have you. So excited to talk about the book of Revelation. Of course, we're having the study in person as well later this evening, but we're going to record some stuff so that uh, if you're interested, you can get get the information, catch up with us, whatever you, whatever you might find useful, uh, find these videos useful for. Before we begin, before we get into the content, uh, I want to read Psalm 1 with you. So if you have a Bible near you, please go ahead and grab, grab it, open up to Psalm 1, pause the video if you need to, to find it. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree, planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Let's pray. Merciful God, please protect and preserve us from the way of the wicked. We thank you that you have put our wickedness, our sin and guilt to death on the cross of your son, Jesus Christ, who now rules and reigns all things to your glory. We thank you that you have paid for our sins with the blood of, of Jesus, more precious than gold or silver. And so therefore you have made us more precious than gold or silver. And you have promised us an eternal home with you uh, when it's our time to leave this world. Please keep us mindful of these eternal things, these transcendent truths as we sojourn here through this world. Help us through our troubles, through our times of stress, anxiety. Use the words of Revelation to let us know that we are dearly, dearly loved, and that we are on the winning side through Jesus Christ and through faith in him. We ask for your blessing as we turn to your word where you promise to speak to us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as we get started, uh, we're going to we're gonna go ahead and this time we're just talking about uh, introductory stuff as we go, as we head into the text of Revelation. As if you've clicked on this video, if you're interacting with our material, you probably have some knowledge of Re Revelation, or at least you've heard of it in the past. And my guess would be that maybe there's a little bit of nerves or <laughs> anxiety, or maybe you've heard quite a bit and you consider yourself somewhat of an expert. I promise you that I will give you the, the biblical perspective, the Lutheran perspective based on the Bible, and uh, that we will proceed from there. I'm not going <laughs> to interject a ton of my own uh, opinions. Well, I say that now, and, and those of you who have taken a Bible study with me, you know I, you know I have a lot of my own personality in it, which is fine. As a companion piece to this study, uh, we are requiring people who are taking it in person to purchase a copy of Wayne Mueller's um, Revelation Commentary from the People's Bible Series published by Northwestern Publishing House. I will include a link to that uh, to that website so you can order it in the description of this video. Uh, but if you can't find that link, just simply go to nph.net and search for Wayne Mueller's People's Bible Revelation. Uh, that will be so helpful as we get into Revelation. Even if you fall off and you don't don't keep up with us, I highly recommend that you get that book and you go ahead and read it. Anybody who has interest in Revelation as a Bible study will be a great will be a great resource for you. So part of the reason why you might be anxious, nervous, scared, or you might know that other people are about reading the book of Revelation is because the the door for interpretation seems to be wide open. A lot of people take advantage of the of the language of Revelation, the imagery, the metaphor, and uh, kind of take it and run with it. We're not going to do that as we get into Revelation. We're not going to take 
the language, uh, the images that are portrayed in Revelation and go with it wherever we want. We want to base any interpretation, any idea of the of the visions that St. John had uh, were revealed to him. We want to base anything that we say off of um, about those off of clear words from Scripture. Because as you get into Scripture, uh, we want we are told that it's our responsibility to interpret Scripture according to its own context. So Paul writes to young young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Two things to highlight there. All Scripture, with the variety of authors that it has, uh, ultimately has one author, and that's that's our God. He has inspired, he has breathed out the words of, of Scripture, which we say means that you can trust it because God doesn't change his mind, he doesn't lie, and that uh, that we can assume that all of Scripture is written for generally the same purpose, and we're going to talk about that more in a little bit. The other thing to highlight is that all Scripture is useful. It has a it has a a, a use that we sh we we want to open up scripture with the goal of being helped in some way, uh, not just to study scripture for so that we know names of kings and everything. That's important to get the historical context, as we'll talk about in a second. But whenever you interact with scripture, you are going to be helped. Paul is saying you're going to be taught, you're going to be rebuked, you're going to be corrected, you're going to be trained. And righteousness, kind of like the psalm that we opened up with, Psalm Psalm number one. It's a psalm about how important it is to ground yourself in in what God has to say in the law of the Lord, and and good things will happen. Not saying that your life will always be easy or joyful or or whatever, but you will be grounded in the truth. Um, another thesis statement for the word is recorded in the Gospel of Saint John. Uh, we will say that this. This is the same author as the, the guy who was inspired to write Revelation. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, is in his gospel. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So ultimately, the greatest use of scripture is to connect you with your Savior, Jesus, who is the promised Messiah. The whole Old Testament po points ahead to Jesus coming. He is the Son of God and to give you life. So the all of scripture is united by that purpose. And so we're not going to take a look at Revelation looking for anything other than this, anything other than the truth of God written through a man named John and to be helped, to be taught, to be corrected, to be rebuked and trained in righteousness, ultimately to be connected to our Savior, to be pointed to Jesus, about whom the whole book of Revelation uh, focuses and, and, and centers. So that that alone keeps us responsible. We have we have to make sure we have to double check anything we want to say about this book against those things. Is it is it useful? Does it sound like the rest of scripture? Does it sound like it also comes from God, that singular author? Um, and does it connect me to my savior? Now, in practice, I want to highlight a couple a couple extra verses. So Paul, both of these selections are from what are called the pastoral epistles, the letters that uh, Apostle Paul wrote to church leaders. or I, I said Pastor Timothy earlier on, that might be a bit of an anachronism. But these are people, these are guys, Timothy and Titus, who were being trained up to, to do a lot of preaching and teaching and leadership. And Paul has some very sharp uh, encouragements for them. So I'm it, it, go ahead and pause the video if you need to and open up to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and find verses 3 to 7. And I'm going to go ahead and read it right now. So Paul says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to, vote, to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. You may be wondering why I wanted to include that in an introduction to uh, the study of Revelation, and I think it's I think it's fairly important to remember uh, at, through Paul's encouragements to Timothy 
that we want to be careful about injecting too much of our own interests or our own um, rabbits that we want to chase into the study of scripture. Now, I'm not saying that your personal questions should are not fair game or it's somehow sinful to be confused and to want, want specific questions answered. But especially with the book of Revelation, it seems a lot of people take it and run with it, run with the imagery presented therein in directions that they want to go without holding themselves accountable to the rest of rest of God's word. If you review the two verses that we looked at a, a minute ago, you'll see that uh, that scripture has one one purpose, and that's to connect us to, to Jesus, to help us realize that we can't save ourselves and see salvation and eternal life as a gift in Jesus' sake. And so if we're going to depart from that purpose, that's that's pretty serious. I mean, the stakes are, are pretty high, and that's why Paul says to Timothy to watch out for people who are pulling you in those directions. I know that it's kind of scary because then you, you're you sensing that you have some sort of responsibility to uh, keep a sharp eye out, to be discerning with what kind of material you're presented with, what kind of teachers um, you're listening to about Revelation. Uh, I'm probably not the only YouTube video you've ever watched or, or a message you've ever interacted with about Revelation. And you might be already, you might have a little bit of trepidation. You might um, be a little bit suspicious about what I might be able to teach you or, or where I'm coming from. And that's actually, I'm going to say that's okay. That's fine. Uh, be suspicious. Check what I am about to say against scripture. And if I say anything wrong, tell me uh, on the basis of, of scripture and, and plain reason, as uh, somebody I know in history said. But Paul also said to Timothy in those verses that the goal of this command is love. He's not saying hate people uh, who take scripture in a certain way, but but this is so important. Uh, Paul's love for the word and the, and Timothy's love for the word is so strong and their love for people is so strong. That's why we don't want to get uh, too sidetracked into, into other stuff. But then also, I, I just thought Titus 3 uh, verses 1 to 11 had so much to do with this as well where Paul writes to young leader Titus, who is also being trained up in the ministry, remind the people to be subject to rulers and to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of, our, of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. So Paul gives this soaring, beautiful explanation of the gospel. He says we were saved we, before we lived in malice and envy. We were sinful. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, as he says uh, also in F, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. But God saved us. He saved us through this through his mercy, not because of righteous things we had done. And that's that's the pure gospel right there. In, in Lutheran circles, we say that's the law pointing out our sin and the seriousness of it, how we could not save ourselves. We were dead in our transgressions of sins and then leading us by the hand to the gospel that God saves us purely by his grace and unconditional love. And that's why we want to avoid foolish controversies and genealogies. That was a big deal in, in Paul's day and arguments and quarrels and, and stuff like that. We want to, we want to discuss together the the meaning of the text in front of us here today, Revelation, as we're getting started. We want to have conversations about it. We want to answer questions. We want to get people closer to understanding God's word and, and the beauty of Revelation. Um, but we want, to, we want to try to be careful and avoid where that might veer into the, into the, the area of divisiveness or, or making uh, or, or misusing the text for our, our own purposes. So how do we do that? As you see at the top of the screen, keeping with the context is key. 
the way that we keep keep with the context, the way that is the way that we avoid making the text about something that it's not really about. And the way we can see it is that there are three types of context that we want to be careful about, that we want to want to have our sights on. First of all, what's the original social context in which the, the words of Revelation were written that will help us when we understand a little bit about the history to help us put it into perspective. And, and because God inspired the Apostle John to write this, and I say the Apostle John because there's really no good reason to think it's anybody else. It could have been a different guy named John, but but this is so in tune with John's other writings that that I'm not convinced that there's a good argument for any other author other than the human John, uh, Apostle John, inspired by God, of course. God is the ultimate author. But he, as he wrote and sent Revelation to the churches that he sent it to, he obviously thought this would be helpful to them. And so that's going to help our our interpretation of Revelation as well. What's the immediate significance and the immediate social context in which this book was sent? But then there's the there's the context of the book itself. What's the genre? How do how is John writing? Uh, that will help us interpret verses correctly. We don't want to take verses out of their context and interpret figure it, things that are meant to be taken figuratively, literally. We don't want to interpret things that are meant to be taken literally, figuratively. And that's not something we're going to talk about a ton today. Uh, I would like to save that for when we get into the text. Uh, together next time in in a fuller way. But then the third, the third and possibly most important is the wider biblical context. Where is Revelation in the Bible? Where does it sit? We just said earlier on in this video that Revelation is not going to present anything that disagrees with the rest of Scripture. We take that as an assumption because it's one author and that's God, and He has one one major purpose with all of Scripture, and that's to that's to preach to us law and gospel, sin and grace, to get us to despair of our own efforts of salvation and to trust in Jesus as our Savior. So understanding that that's the wider biblical context where it sits in the Bible is important. But also as we get deeper into Revelation, we're going to see uh, a lot of use of the Old Testament. And that's frankly, that's one of the biggest spots where people go astray is they interpret revelation as if it's own if it's its own book it sits on its own own place but no john is obviously cognizant of the rest of scripture and it that's so obvious that it cannot be denied so that's a that's a pretty important key to to understanding the message of revelation so First things first, going into the social context, this is a picture of uh, the Emperor Nero, who was alive around, you know, 70-ish AD. Uh, one, of the, one of the major persecutions of the Christian church was under Emperor Nero. He was the he was the emperor during the time that Rome burned down. He he blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians. He said this is the Christians' fault and generated a lot of angst and anger against the Christians. Some people think that Revelation was written in the context of Nero's reign because it's obvious that Christians are being persecuted as you read Revelation. But it's a little too early. Uh, if if it were during Nero's reign, it would be about 70-ish AD or, or before. So before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish temple, the temple of Herod in Jerusalem. And then uh, people who think, who take the earlier date for revelation either on or before 70 ad say that a lot of the prophecies have to do with the destruction of the of herod's temple in jerusalem uh i agree with some other many other commentators it's the majority opinion is that it's actually written in the 90s ad as as john the apostle is exiled on the island of patmos over by asia minor uh closer to 90 ad 95 ish ad under the reign of this guy Emperor Domitian, or Domitian, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, we're not going to take points off or give you a downgrade if you say Domitian or Domitian at all, uh, who was also responsible for a pretty major persecution of the Christians. And one of the reasons why Domitian's rule fits a little bit better the context of Revelation is you can tell as you read Revelation that pers persecution of the Christians is serious um 
but it's it's kind of represented by this annoyance with Christianity. Christianity is kind of uh, treated as a cult because if you think about it, as you read like the Book of Acts and stuff like that, if if a non Christian or non Jewish person in the first century met a Christian and they heard them talk, they would hear them bring up all the Old Testament scriptures. They would hear them bring up uh, prophecies, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all this stuff. And if you had no clue about any of this, you would just assume that you were talking to a Jewish person. So Judaism and Christianity obviously have the same roots because both, both faith traditions accept the Old Testament as the true word of God. It's just that Christianity takes it, takes it even further. When Jesus came and said that all these scriptures testify about me, John, John chapter 8, verse uh, verse. Third, or I'm sorry, John chapter five, verse 39. He said that I'm the fulfillment of the, of the old Testament and those who rejected Jesus own testimony remained in, remained in the, the Jewish religion. And the Christianity was simply a continuation of that that now trusted in Jesus. So if you were an emperor like Domitian or Nero or one of these guys, uh, you, you might not really notice the difference between Christianity and Judaism. They, these rulers were definitely not, not interested in any of the theological debates between Judaism and Christianity. Let them figure it out. That's their problem. But the, the what was the norm at the time in the Roman Empire was polytheism. So belief in many, many different gods and emperor worship. And one, one of those gods is, is Caesar. You are to sacrifice and pray to Caesar. So Nero had people sacrifice and pray to him. Domitian was fine with people sacrificing and praying to him. They didn't require Judaism to do this because the Roman Empire and, and Judaism had a very strong uh, history of contention that you might already know something about that the Judea, the Judea was very contentious, uh, a place of lots of rebellions, revolts, and stuff like that. And so Judaism had the had the mark of a, a permitted religion uh, that Rome was fine with Jews doing their own thing. There was some confusion, it seems, about whether or not the sacrifices done by the Jews were to the emperor or on the emperor's behalf. And it's possible that they kind of rode that confusion for all it was worth so that they didn't get persecuted. But then Christians show up and they're they're diverting from Judaism in a major way because they're they're not doing any sacrifices. They're not meeting in the synagogue necessarily. And they're and they're proclaiming this form of monotheism that the more people understand about it, the more they realize that it's it's not the exact same thing that the Jews are saying at the time either. So Christianity is gaining more more notoriety. People, uh, it's gaining more understanding, more awareness, and and people are understanding the difference between Christianity that accepts Jesus as as a savior and and Judaism that rejects him. And so Domitian has his eye on this and he's saying that like Christians are kind of weird. And especially when they didn't participate in the emperor worship that everybody else did, that seemed so odd to everyone. So Christians are, are weird and it seemed not patriotic. So then it was actually the emperor later on after Domitian uh, Trajan, who said that if anyone's found out to be a Christian, they should be uh, formally accused and persecuted and possibly put to death. So this is a crescendo. Nero, Nero's persecution was already pretty bad. And then Domitian's kind of annoyance and frustration with the anti-patriotism of the Christians, that, that was a big deal as well. So that's the, that's the frustrating, somewhat painful situation in the, in the, when Revelation was written. So this is a picture of Machiavelli. <laughs> he wrote The Prince. He was an Italian from the 15th, 15th, 16th century. And what does the prince have to do with Revelation? Well, Machiavelli, uh, in The Prince, he said, he said that it's better to be feared than loved, as if you're going to be a ruler. Re uh, better to be feared than loved. Now, why do you think he said that? He probably said that because... If people are afraid of you, if they have this like 
informed respect of you and they don't want to cross you, then it's easier to guide, to guide and lead a nation. If people love you, then they'll walk all over you. If you're, if you're a generous person, happy, loving, then people might not understand that your that their actions have consequences and you might overspend yourself trying to win people over, trying to get people to love you. Whereas maintaining fear is a lot easier. Now he, he did say that you got to make sure people don't hate you, uh, but that they're just afraid of you. Now, a guy like Domitian, he kind of wanted both. He wanted his cake and eat, and to eat it too. He, the Roman emperor culture, like the aristocracy, was uh, was a subculture of flattery of trying to trying to get on people's good side. So Domitian would have been surrounded by people who showed love for him, who just adored him and and gave him all these compliments because they wanted to be on his good side because they were afraid. Because as you might know about Roman history, there's a rich history of assassinations and and quelling rebellions and a lot of violence and, and all this stuff. Uh, Roman emperors trying to trying to protect their le legitimacy to the throne and everything. And so Domitian actually got pretty used to people referring to him as God and savior. He, he kind of liked that when people said, oh, they would acknowledge the emperor worship to his face and say, wow, you're so amazing. You are, you are a God. You are the one and only Lord. And he loved that. But when Christians refused to say that, because of course there's only one true God and it's the God of the Bible, he would get upset. And so his feelings got hurt and then he would, he would react uh, against that. That was part of why he hate, started to really hate the Christians and uh, be complicit with their persecution and, and their martyrdom. So the, the most important person in the world right now, the, the person who has all the authority, holds all the cards, he's also a temperamental person. It's easy to get on his bad side. And, and if he wants to, there's no checks and balances if he wants to just wipe out his haters and so that's a that's a culture of fear. So that's it for the the presentation. But the question is, what about God? <laughs> is God a Machiavellian kind of leader? In God's in God's eyes, is he one who wants us to be afraid of him or or what? Because you you get verses like this, even in Revelation, Revelation 2. Chapter 10, Jesus says, be faithful even to the point of death, and I'll give you the life as your victor's crown. Does that inspire fear or love in you? What do you think? Or take Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Kind of scary. Or think about that, that psalm that we read at the first, uh, as we began this study. The, that the the wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away. The wicked will not stand in the judgment and their way leads to destruction. That sounds kind of kind of fearful, doesn't it? But in cases like this, when you're when you're tempted to simply be afraid of God, now now that's those are law law truths, of course, right? That God has the right to punish evil. He he is holy, he has the right to punish evil. Uh, the unholy God is not into sin. God, God is not a fan of sin. Sin ruined his creation and it, it incurs his wrath, of course. And so those are all reasons to be afraid of God. But, but the gospel is also the truth in, in scripture. A verse like Isaiah 40, verse 1 comes to mind. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. He's commanding Isaiah, his prophet, yeah, who has to preach a lot of law, but you're also your your task is to bring comfort to people because while God is angry at sin, also he's angry about what sin has done to you. He's angry about how sin has affected your life. God is not happy that the Christians were persecuted under Domitian. God is not thrilled about that. And so he wants to give revelation as a, as a comfort to them and as a comfort to you, knowing what you have to go through in this, in this life as well. And John, the, the same apostle that recorded Revelation, says in one of his epistles, John, 1 John 4, verse 8, the, the latter portion, he says that God is love. That is God's primary characteristic. Yes, God is just. God is holy. He is eternal. He's powerful. He's wise. But he is love. He loves you. That's his primary 
motivation for recording Revelation. And so even behind God's warnings against against sin, against wickedness of all kinds, warning about the what kind of punishment they, they incur and stuff like that, that is all motivated by God's love. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants you in heaven with him. That's why he sent Jesus to be your savior, to atone for all of your sins in the first place. And that's why he gives us a book like Revelation. So it is not to scare us. It is not to confuse us. It is not to, to make us afraid of God. But Revelation is a book that is given for our comfort. And that is so important for us to keep in mind as we go forward. It's written in this social context of fear because Domitian is persecuting the Christians pretty intensely. The, the Jewish synagogues are also not a fan of Christians because of the differences that are already becoming apparent between Christianity and Judaism. So there's a lot of, lot of tension in the culture. There's a lot of stuff going on. And there will be easy points as we read Revelation together where we see the, the parallels between those, those tensions and the tensions in our modern, in our modern culture. And so God gives us revelation, just like he gave it to those first Christians who read it first for our comfort, for our benefit. And that's, that's going to guide our time together as we study, as we study this, this text together. So my takeaway question for you is to read Revelation 1 verses 1 to 8. And I want you to think about phrases that might evoke fear, that Machiavellian stuff that we were just talking about. What might sound scary as you read just those first eight verses? And then you p and then pick out phrases that testify to God's loving purpose behind Revelation. Try to parse those out. See if you can catch both of them. And before, before we meet next time, I'm going to ask people who come to this study in person to read Revelation chapters 1 and 2. Try to make through uh, both those chapters. And then, of course, they'll be picking up a copy of Wayne Mueller's People's Bible Revelations. Revelation commentary, and they'll they'll read corresponding sections of that. So if you're joining us in person next time, that's great, and uh, and we'll get you a copy of one of those, and and we'll proceed. God bless your study. God bless your time in Revelation. Continue to to love it and to seek God's comfort in this fascinating book of the Bible. Looking forward to talking to you more about it.